Julie talked to you all about sex. I'm going to talk to you all about moderates. Um, <laughs> equally exciting, right? Equally exciting. Um, do we have any moderates in the room? Show of hands. OK, so I would recommend to all the moderates that you get your cell phones out, or your smartphones out. Uh, I'm going to try to be provocative enough that you're going to want to tweet angry things at me. Um, so uh, that it's at Dave Carp right there. Um, my name is Dave Carp. I also blog at shoutingloudly.com. As Mika said, I have a new book out called The Move-On Effect. It came out two weeks ago, so I thought I should come here and talk mostly about something else, actually. Um, I want to give you a little bit of background on myself and how I end up on this stage. Um, I was a, an organizer with the Sierra Club for a long time, uh, running the, the Sierra Student Coalition about a dozen years ago, which was student-run arms. Um, and I entered graduate school in political science in 2003 as the Dean campaign was happening. Um, when I was trained as an organizer, we were still using phone banks, we were still using phone trees because we had to. Uh, and it was around the time of the Dean campaign that I realized that there was something different going on with the internet that I needed to figure out. So I did what any good graduate student would do, and I started reading lots and lots of things. Uh, it's been an honor to be up here because the things that I was reading uh, were by people who have been on this stage. David Weinberger, uh, Clay Shirky, who was on a panel. All, all of the authors who make up the Personal Democracy Forum and make this conference so important were the people that I was reading, reading to try to figure out what has changed. Uh, and in the process of all that, I came to be convinced, firstly, that yes, the internet can transform politics. But also, and I don't think this will offend anyone here, it does not transform politics everywhere at once. So what my book is about and what I want to talk to you about today is some of the spaces where we find limitations, we find constraints. Uh, we talked a lot yesterday about SOPA and about what we can learn from that victory. Um, I'd like to focus our attention not on an epic victory, but also on an epic fail, because I think we need to learn from that as well. Um, so what I want to talk about is Americans Elect. Uh, show of hands, who's heard of Americans Elect? Who knows this story? Most of you, good. Um, so Americans Elect pretty much debuted last summer. Tom Friedman, along with a lot of other centrist pundits, uh, took to their perches and started talking about this new thing that would change politics. Tom Friedman told us, write it down, Americans Elect. What Amazon.com did to books, what the blogosphere did to newspapers, what the iPod did to music, what drugstore.com did to pharmacies, Americans Elect plans to do to the two-party duopoly that has dominated American political life. Remove the barriers to real competition, flatten the incumbents, and let the people in. Watch out. Uh, now, this was supposed to be different from previous centrist presidential candidacies. Because rather than a candidate, this was going to be a process. This was going to use the internet to allow everybody to vote in their own online primary and select a third party centrist candidate who would then run against the two party duopoly. Uh, and the process was set out to be pretty simple. Anyone could run, so long as they had some credentials, so long as they had uh, held public office before, they just needed to get 10,000 supporters, 1,000 supporters per state in 10 states uh, in order to be deemed a candidate and then this summer they would have their online primaries. To give you a sense of that scale, how big we're talking about, uh, I checked, Mika Sifri has about 10,000 people following him on Twitter. Uh, Mika, do you want to run for president? I, I want to, yes. Yes? Okay. <laughs> so we're a little late, yeah, yeah, all right, cool. <laughs> you object. <laughs> um, so we're a little late in the process, but think about that. Uh, you know, we all here think Mika is a pretty big deal. Um, he, he could get, if every one of his supporters said yes, he could then get nominated and we could debate him amongst the Americans elect process this summer. Um, except, of course, that it didn't happen. Um, Americans elect failed. Uh, and it didn't just fail, it, it failed pretty big. This wasn't just a situation where we got a candidate, but then they failed to win the presidency or really challenge the two parties. We didn't even get a candidate. Uh, so after a year of heavily publicizing themselves, after a year of being on The Daily Show, The Colbert Report, all sorts of media outlets, letting the public know about this, it came time to nominate candidates. And the highest supporter was uh, Buddy Romer, who got uh, 6,293 supporters. Um, putting this in context, Ron Paul could, I would expect, get over 10,000 people by accident online. He's got huge amounts of supporters, yet he didn't direct them, hey, I, I suppose he didn't want the third party nod, so he didn't go for it. Um, and so this is a situation in which 
they built this great online public, and yet nobody showed up. Now at first, I as a political scientist wasn't paying a lot of attention. As somebody who cares about technology, I started paying attention when South by Southwest gave Americans elect their People's Choice Award. Back in March, the internet public, the people who think about how technology is changing society, took a look at Americans elect and said, this is the future, this is important. We were wrong about that, and I think it's important for us to learn from that. Um, so as, after Americans elect failed, after nobody showed up to this, the same pundits who had said this is going to change the world came back and said, well, it was an idea ahead of its time. Now I want to make clear, it's not just that Americans elect has turned out not to be the next iPod, it's turned out not to be the next Google Wave. <laughs> and yet they are now telling us, well, it's an idea ahead of its time. Next time, let's try it again. Um, I want to convince you today that I, Americans elect was fundamentally flawed. It's based on a fundamental misunderstanding of how the internet works. Uh, and for that reason, I want to encourage us in 2016, when these some, same pundits I'm sure we'll come back. I want to encourage at least us, the internet public, to exercise more caution and say, you know what, we think you're probably wrong. Um, so to do that, uh, I actually want to be a, a Clay Shirky hipster for a second. Um, I'm from Brooklyn, so I've, you know, I've got to. Um, Clay Shirky, back in 1999, I told you I read a lot of this uh, early stuff. Uh, Clay Shirky, in this article called The Interest Horizons and the Limits of Software Love, uh, was writing about just how big we thought open source would get. And what he said is, commercial companies make software for money, so money is the limiting factor on what those companies can build. Open source developers make software for the love of the thing, so love becomes the limiting factor. Unloved software cannot be built using open source methods. The point here, and I think as we look back on this writing today, open source, I would say, has been a success but it hasn't achieved everything that open source proponents of the late 90s were hoping for. Open source is everywhere, but we don't find it as the only thing everywhere. Um, as I look around this room, I see a lot of Macintoshes, and I'm, I bet that most of them are not running Linux, uh, yet it, Linux is, based, is baked in. Um, and so the lesson that I take from this is that there are limits to user-generated content. And again, I want to suggest to you that it's based on love. It's based on motivation. Um, another old lesson. This is Chris Anderson's book uh, that everyone at PDF was focusing on and talking about a few years ago, The Long Tail. The lesson that I at least take away from Chris Anderson's work is that lowering the transaction costs of online communication allows us to see the truer de demand curve for public participation. So his point about what The Long Tail has done to music is that now types of music that would only get 200 customers, well, it used to be that with high transaction costs you couldn't sell it, and now you can buy that on iTunes, or you can find that uh, on BitTorrent, or as we learned yesterday, don't go there. Um, and so those are two perspectives, not on politics, but on how the internet changes society. And what they suggest to us is that the internet works differently when you've got high but pent up demand than when you've got low demand. The internet doesn't create our interests, it reveals them. Um, and this then takes me to what I wanna suggest to you or leave you with today, is what I call the field of dreams fallacy. There is no radical center in America. Uh, I've been running a site since 2008 called the Blogosphere Authority Index that tracks the top political blogs on the American left and the American right. I have from time to time tried to construct the same rankings for the American center. I've never been able to because there are no high traffic blogs for the American center. That's not because nobody tries to build them. It's because while we build them all the time, there isn't a big public that shows up. Though there are plenty of centrists in America, they tend to be the ones who are not following politics, are not motivated to get involved. The motivated publics in American politics are, have all chosen a side. They are on the left or on the right. And the internet is good for community. The internet is most useful to allowing communities to operate. So when we think about American Select, this is an organization that overall they spent about $35 million on this project. They spent $9 million apparently on their website. Websites do not require a fancy interface in order to attract a public. There's Craigslist. <laughs> is Craig still here? <laughs> this is not a fancy interface. Uh, but what we saw with Craigslist, what we've seen with a lot, and I could put up a lot of other, of other photos of old, old websites that nonetheless served a public and therefore became transformatively useful. 
Technology does not create participatory communities. It supports them. When you lack a participatory, participatory community, I don't care how nice your technology is, it's gonna end up a ghost town. It's gonna end up with tumbleweed, which is exactly what just happened on an epic scale with Americans Elect. Lacking a motivated centrist public, it doesn't matter how much you build, in, how much you spend on a fancy website, you're going to be left with no public. So that's the first lesson that I wanna offer you. The second is that you cannot buy an engaged public. With $35 million, Americans Elect was actually able to buy ballot access on over half of the states in the nation. There will be an Americans Elect line, though I suppose there will be nobody on it in all of those states. And that's because with enough money, you can pay people to go gather petitions and therefore qualify to be on the ballot. You can buy a fancy website, you can buy fancy PR, you can buy uh, ballot access, but you cannot buy an engaged public. That's not going to change between now and 2016. In order to build an engaged public, we need to listen, we need to organize, we need to go to where they are and empower them. And that was, I think, the core mistake that they made. Um, in the end, the reason why I come to you, and this is a little bit beating a dead horse, and I don't want Americans elect supporters to feel like, you know, he's blaming us for even trying. I never want to blame someone for trying. But the reason why even a month later I stay animated about this is because they spent $35 million on what was essentially an internet gimmick. Every four years we get this attempt to build an online centrist candidacy, and every four years it ends in a failure. Meanwhile, uh, one organization that I pay attention to, I'm not at all related to them, but there's an organization called fairvote.org, which is the leading uh, electoral reform organization in America. If you've heard of the National Pop Popular Vote, they're the organization behind that. Their annual budget is less than $500,000 a year. So if nothing else, what I wanna leave you with is four years from now, next time, when the centrist pundits tell you, thanks to the internet, politics is gonna be radically different. Let's waste, say, 15 million on that and put 20 million towards worthwhile purposes. Um, in closing, what I wanna suggest to you is that changing the world still requires organizations and resources. This is the reason why the failure of Americans Elect is so important, is because the money spent on that is money that could have been spent on better projects, and those projects currently are going underfunded. Technology supports organized communities. It hasn't rendered them irrelevant. And we as the internet public, or as a set of internet publics, need to understand these limits, these constraints, in order to best, better invest our time and energy to create a better world. Thank you.